All right, we are five o'clock. So they always say it's five o'clock somewhere, and it is here. So now that I'm out of throw up mode after seeing the split screen, <laughs> I'm here to talk about website performance tuning. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I know it's the last session of the day, and uh, it's been a long day. Um, hopefully, I'll, I might even wrap this up a little quick for you guys. Um, before we start, I've got to um, say thank you to all of the sponsors of DNN Connect, um, which make this all possible, as does your attendance itself. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Ron Eastman. I'm the Director of Technical Support for Manage.com, um, also formerly known as PowerDNN. And I, I wore a, a nice classic shirt today uh, in honor of PowerDNN. Um, I started five years ago um, with PowerDNN. Um, I did tech support for them uh, for a while. Um, I came into it with a pretty strong general knowledge of, of web hosting and server administration. Um, after I started, um, I, was a, I was a student, uh, an adult student returning, um, and I got my Bachelor of Science in Management Information Systems, so a little bit of business and a little bit of computer science all wrapped up into one. Um, my specialty in that was, was uh, SQL. Um, I, database administration was ultimately my goal. Um, so I've stayed with Manage.com since, so, um, so I'm not really doing that, but I do get to touch a lot of SQL, which is nice. Um, it helps keep me, keep me in tune for that. Um, and, but the SQL um, training uh, and education did help me focus on efficiency. So efficiency has become something that I, I value a lot. Um, it's something that uh, um, our customers value a lot as well, and, and my support team that I manage um, is, is very helpful in helping someone make their site efficient. Uh, so our agenda today, uh, first, why does performance matter? Um, we're going to talk about what, what, uh, why it's important in the first place. Um, we're going to talk about a tool that you can use to easily measure performance of a website. I'm going to show you a little bit of how to use it and some of the advanced features. Um, then we're going to also show how it can be used to uh, do a little bit of troubleshooting and solve some major problems on a website. And at the end, if we have any time and you guys have any questions, uh, we'll have a little bit of time for questions as well. So why does performance matter? Um, this is uh, information I got from Pingdom. Um, so pingdom.com uh, slash 2017. Um, you can see that over time, uh, we've got a, our graphs here, if you can see from back there, uh, we started uh, 2013. A typical average site uh, was about one and a half megs. Um, had about 95 separate element requests uh, to load that web page. Uh, 2014 grew to 1,900 uh, kilobytes, uh, 2015, 2,200, 2016 were at 2,400 kilobytes, and 2017 uh, the average was a whopping 3,400 kilobytes. So web pages are getting much larger. Uh, we have a higher expectation um, uh, of things because of broadband. However, uh, while broadband is common and, and uh, it's you know even getting to some of the more remote parts of the world, um, a lot of people are now accessing from phones, which means you're, you're actually loading uh, pages on a device and over a network that is not anywhere near what you might have at home. So, um, so why does that matter if it's, if it's getting larger? Well, um, because you're going to have a bounce rate on your site if your site doesn't load fast. So this is a graph also from Ping Pingdom. Um, shows us a, the blue line is what we focus on here. It's the bounce rate. Uh, we can see that uh, at up to two seconds, uh, a typical website might have about a 7% bounce rate. So someone hits the site and then they leave it. They don't go any further on it. Once we get past that three second mark, you can see our bounce rate starts to rise. So uh, we get to four seconds, we're about 20% bounce rate. Um, we get up to eight seconds of load time, we're up to a 60% bounce rate. And you start getting up in the teens of bounce rates. Uh, your, or your teens of uh, seconds to load, your bounce rate actually gets up to about 80%. So consumers and, and website users don't have a lot of patience uh, for a, a long load time. And so it's kind of, uh, that's why I think this should be a, a focus still. So we're going to talk about webpagetest.org. Um, there's a lot of tools out, that, out there that you can use to uh, test a web page. Google has a, a wonderful tool, um, as does Pingdom. Um, webpagetest.org is one of the original ones. Um, it's a, a great tool originally developed by AOL for internal use. It became open source in 2008. Um, currently, the project is, is maintained mostly by Google. Um, they do most of the development and, and uh, pull requests on it. 
Um, and then uh, because they have such a, a, a focus now on performance for websites. And you can actually download an instance from GitHub and run it locally. So this is what webpagetest.org looks like. Um, I'm gonna, my uh, presentation does get a little bit uh, confusing here because I'm gonna do a combination of slides and pull up actual browser windows to look at different things. So let's see if I can get that to launch. So this is a, a launches a right to a basic test um, where we can go in and, and type the uh, URL of a website with, say, for example, we want to test dnnconnect.org. Uh, we can choose where our test is taking place. It defaults to Dulles, Virginia, which is where webpagetest.org is, is located. Um, you can select from a map. Uh, the drop down is uh, pretty handy though for checking. Um, so we can go past North America and get to Europe. Uh, we see uh, Ireland since dnnconnect.org is probably getting more hits from Ireland this week than uh, any other time. So we'll select dnnconnect.org. Um, we've also got some other options that we can choose from. Um, the, uh, before we get into that though, test location, when you're using this tool, uh, probably a good idea to pick a test location that is realistic. Um, you're, if you're testing dnnconnect.org during the week of DNN Connect being held in Ireland, it makes sense to test it from Ireland to see how it's operating. But testing it from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia is not gonna get you a realistic result for, for what a user experience is really like. Um, you can choose your browser. Um, right now, Chrome is about 60% market share on browsers uh, utilization, 12% for Safari and 12% for Firefox. So I generally default to Chrome. Um, we've got some other options too if we open up the advanced settings tree. So uh, we can choose different connection types, and so this is what's available for the Ireland connection. Uh, we can simulate a 4G connection, uh, we can use a, a typical cable modem connection. Um, we can do a number of tests to run. Um, the reason why you might do that is, is you might want to see what a first load looks like, a second load, and a third load. Um, I generally, most of what I'm going to show you today is just done with one load. We have um, also keep test private, it defaults to that, um, which is handy if you're testing a client's site and you don't want them to be able to go look up uh, the history of the, the site tests. Um, you can kind of maintain a little privacy and I like that it defaults to keeping it private. Uh, we've got several other tabs. I'm not gonna cover all of them, but I, I just wanna hit a couple highlights here. Um, the auth tab, uh, is an authorization tab, or authentication tab rather, uh, where you can use a username and password if you have a site that is primarily loaded after a login page. Uh, you can put login credentials here. Uh, it gives a nice warning, uh, letting you know that to keep your test private, it's a good idea to, uh, um, or it, to use a test account for that that you create just for the test. Uh, we also have a script section uh, where you can enter scripts uh, there's a lot of custom scripts, and you notice they've got a link for documentation there to show you how to make scripts to do different things. Um, but this is where you can plop a script in, and several of the examples I'm going to show do use scripts. Uh, we can put in blocks, um, and the blocks allow us to uh, block certain uh, elements on the site, and we also have single point of failure to simulate situations where we have a uh, different source that might be failing, and we'll kind of, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. And then we have a custom tab, which I've never used before. So, back to that. So I did a web page test. Uh, this is manage.com, our website. Um, this is run from Denver, Colorado. It's one of the closer locations to uh, the data center, which we host this site from, which is in Bellevue, Nebraska, in the middle of the United States. Um, on this test here, uh, we're going to go through uh, what the letter grades mean. Uh, we have first start off with a time to first byte. Um, that in this case scores an A. Um, the value is calculated, I have that on the bottom, or it's uh, 100 minus the observed first byte time minus the target first byte time divided by 10. And the target first byte time is the round trip time times three plus any SSL handshake time. In this case, our first byte was uh, about uh, half of a second, 0.459 of a second, um, which does score an A um, in their rating scale. 
Uh, their rating scale, there's letter grades, traditional, um, same as you probably saw in college, uh, where a 90 plus is an A, an 80 to 89 is a B, et cetera. Our next uh, feature is Keep Alive Enabled. If you have Keep Alive Enabled on your site, it does show you that as an A or as a fail. Um, so it shows the number of reused connections divided by the expected reused connections. Compressed transfer um, is the value is the optimal resource size divided by the actual resource size, and we're talking about the uh, CSS, JavaScript, HTML, no images are included in that. Uh, compressed images has its own section um, where it's the optimized image size versus the actual image size, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then cache static content, uh, which gives a value that's based on the expiration score divided by the number of static resources. The expiration score is uh, 100 if it's one week plus uh, setting on your, on your cache expiration, uh, 50 if it's one hour plus, and zero if it's less than one hour. So now we have uh, the moving down to the performance results area of the page. We have a load time uh, where it's showing our full site load time. Uh, you'll notice that that load time is actually the same as the document complete time, uh, 4.258 seconds in this case. Uh, that's from the first request to the browser load event. It's the same as the document complete. Our next one is our first byte time, uh, which uh, we talked about already. That's your DNS lookup and any server-side processing contributing to that. Start render um, is when the page starts to build and, and show in the browser so you can actually see, a, see some content appearing. And then we have document complete and fully loaded. Uh, document complete is when it uh, fires the document complete uh, message uh, to the browser uh, saying that it's fully loaded, um, but there could be other secondary content that appears after, such as a favicon um, or other post-load events, uh, which show up in the fully loaded section and the cost section I just ignore. So, um, This here is the waterfall view, um, gives us a nice view of our content loading. Um, this is from manage.com, uh, from the live site. Uh, we see uh, right there at the top where we have our first byte time. Uh, th in this case, it's uh, coming in at uh, just about 0.5 seconds, and that's composed of uh, the initial redirect. When I tested this, I tested straight to manage.com. It does a redirect to secure manage.com to HTTPS, um, and that total turnaround, including the SSL handshake, took a half a second. Once that's complete, we can start our document load, in which case our first uh, p uh, part is the default CSS and followed by several other CSS files that start to appear. Um, our start render time uh, is the green line that you see. Um, that's what we looked at before, where the two seconds where we're starting to see content appear on the page. Uh, then we have our uh, document object model, um, which is an object-oriented representation of the web page that's then manipulated later with uh, scripting languages. Um, that is our first real interactive content, so any login buttons or other buttons that might appear on the screen begin to load at the kind of yellowish-orange line. They're completed on the purple line or the violet line. The onload time um, is when the document complete was fired. Um, and that may be only the above the fold content if you have a web page that's going below the, the bottom of the page. And then we have document complete when, when that is fired as well. So I'm going to walk through um, a use case of using web page tests to identify some problems with the site. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at Commerce Bank of Wyoming. Um, it was a site that was created by Intellicom Incorporated um, of Kearney, Nebraska in the United States. Um, they did a full redevelopment of the site in 2018. Um, it's, I, I think, a very nice looking site. Um, they um, did a really nice color palette on it, um, started incorporating some material de design <laughs> principles. It was updating a site that w had a very dated look. Um, the site is very media heavy. Um, it has a lot of pictures. They're great pictures. Um, and there's pretty good navigation on the site through a persistent men top menu bar. So this is Commerce Bank of Wyoming's site. So I'm just going to quickly launch that so we can see it in real life. So this is loading from Bellevue, Nebraska. 
loaded pretty decent. Uh, we, we've got full content here, um, all the way to the bottom. As you might notice, we have a, a slideshow here, uh, which has a lot of picture content in it. So I did an initial test for Commerce Bank of Wyoming using their development site. Um, so that's why you see up in the upper corner there under web page uh, performance test for cbwy.intelecomweb.com. That's where they do dev work for Commerce Bank of Wyoming. Uh, this is their initial test um, from the develop development site. Um, you'll note that we have a first time byte, uh, which is quite high. Um, it's this, uh, I'm going to bring up the waterfall view here. So since I have the link saved, this, even though this is private, I can go back and, and view these tests. Um, our full load time here uh, is 15.718 seconds, uh, not an outstanding number. Our first byte time was 1.13 seconds. Um, our start render um, doesn't start rendering till 3.4 seconds, um, was visually complete though at 16 seconds, which is a really, really long load time. Um, this, we'll note uh, that this has 85 requests, or 80, 86 if you consider the favicon that loads for the site, and we get our waterfall view here that shows the full load of the site. Um, our content, our, those really large pictures uh, that we see, uh, we can actually go down and, and hover over them on the waterfall and look at specific information about that file. Um, so this is one of the uh, images that loaded. Um, we will note there that this image is just, it's just over a megabyte of 1,048 kilobytes. But we'll get back to why the first byte was so slow a little bit later. So I wanted to talk about scripting a navigation sequence or scripting uh, using that feature of web page test. Um, I've got an example here of scripting a navigation sequence and use this example uh, because I think it's important to know uh, when you're testing something using web page test and you're testing a site other than the home page, it's generally a, a good idea to first navigate to the home page, then go secondarily to the page you want to actually run the test on. That way, any cacheable content is loaded, logos, um, CSS files, et cetera, um, because that second, that, that second hit is more like a real life when a, you rarely have someone go straight to events slash 2018 attendees. Um, they generally click through to get to it. In this case, uh, it's important to note that web page test can only log data for one of the parts of a sequence. Um, so I have a log data zero, so it's uh, log data false um, for the initial hit on the site, on the home page. Uh, then we go to log data true when we navigate secondarily to the attendees page. Um, that's just for an example. Um, you can also script the login event. Um, if there's, uh, in addition to that auth section, if there's custom areas for, for that, um, and you can override DNS, which is what I've done for a lot of the testing that I'm going to show you in the next few slides. Um, bottom of the slide does have the uh, location of a lot of great documents on how to use web page test and how to, how to generate the scripts uh, to, to use tests in that way. So here is uh, the web performance test. Um, this is uh, from Denver um, to their site in the UK. Um, and so I used a script on this one. I'll actually bring that up live. There we go. Um, so you can see the script that I ran. Oh, are we on that one? Here we are. Um, it doesn't quite give what I was looking for, but I usually can open up the script. It says scripted test, but you can usually click to see what the script was. Um, the script in this case was an override DNS um, to force, force it to go to the secondary site. 
Uh, just a quick background on why we have this secondary site. Um, they have a high availability environment, so they have redundant sites in Bellevue, Nebraska and the United Kingdom. Being a banking site, they want 100% uptime. Uh, so we actually load balance that to uh, uh, go to the failover site when necessary. And I wanted to show this one because it's a good example of showing a little bit of geographic latency as compared to the other site. Um, so we have a geographic latency that's extra long in this case. Our uh, first byte time is 0.834 seconds, um, and that is the um, partially caused by the SSL handshake that occurs, uh, which is generally at least th uh, three parts of the handshake. Um, but uh, that's what we look like from the UK. So moving back to their US site, I think that's what I'm on here. Yeah, there we go. Um, wanted to show quickly uh, the difference between um, HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, if you're um, hosted on a 2016 or, or later uh, server, um, then you're taking, a, have the opportunity at least to take advantage of HTTP 2 um, if you have um, an SSL on your site. Um, that allows, uh, allows asynchronous hosting to occur, um, uh, ac uh, asynchronous loading of events. Uh, so we can see a difference here. I wanted to show what, it, what that looks like same site in the development site versus the UK site, we see that our load times all start or asynchronously um, for each event as it's triggered. Um, and that, that carries on through um, all the following um, external um, pieces as well. Um, the J JavaScript and CSS are minified on the HTTP2 site that we see here. So an asset to asset comparison is not quite fair on this one, but I, I did want to show the difference in that since we're going to see that as we go through here. So this is Denver to Omaha on their live site. Um, so we were also, we were 14 second load time. So a really, really terrible load time. Um, our first byte um, on this one, this is their live site it is. Um, running HTTP2, if you note the waterfall below, um, we do see that we see the asynchronous load uh, with the, the solid uh, left hand start times for different elements. Um, the, I'm going to launch this one if I can. There we go. There it is. Okay. So, uh, we are a 14 second load time here, um, 0.358 for first byte. Um, our start render is 1.8 seconds, um, but that's a, a really poor load time and a good chance of bouncing a lot of their site visitors if we maintain a load time like that. Um, bringing up the waterfall directly, we can see from the waterfall that uh, the elements that are coming from uh, the server in Bellevue are all loading asynchronously, but they do tend to stair step down uh, since they're all trying to load at the same time and uh, the bandwidth does uh, cause it to, to kind of extend as we get further and further down the list of elements. Um, this one I um, used uh, on their live US server as I mentioned. Um, no, actually no, this one was not. This was uh, a different one that I did where I set them up on a different server, sorry. A little confused on that one. We go to this one. Let's see, are we off the browser? No. Okay. Okay, so this is our. Denver to Omaha. Um, this one, um, I made some changes to it. Um, on, this is not on their live site. I uh, put them in a development environment. I uh, scripted so that I could go to a different IP address for loading the site. Um, going back and we'll, we'll look at the prior one where we had the images uh, were not compressed and we had an F score on that for the images. Our total uh, content uh, for the document was 8.196 kilobytes. Uh, on the compressed images, we got it down to 2,222 uh, 2, kilobytes. 
Um, and that was all just from compressing images. Uh, so I wanted to show a, a neat piece of the tool here. Let's see if I can bring that up. There we go. So if we select the compressed images, it shows us all of our content here and what the uh, 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 sizes are, or the score for it. Uh, we're on the, the new compressed images one. Uh, let's see here. That'd be the one I want. Too many windows open at once. Sorry about this, guys. Um, on this test here that's loading, um, this was uh, the test server uh, with large images. Um, we can get the test up. It's, well, wait for it to load while we're talking about it from this slide. Um, we see we have an, an F for our score on the compressed images. Um, we were at 8,151 kilobytes. Our images were quite large. Um, this one was a test server where I used a script to force a DNS change for that. Um, the tool does offer an image analysis that I wanted to show, but maybe I can show it from one of the other slides. Or on the A. Of course, we're all on good, good scores here. And I can't find, or here we go, image analysis. Um, their tool uh, will look at the images that load on that page. And this is actually pulling from the live site right now. Um, it's going to do an analysis of, of the images um, and then give you a score as well as optimized versions of the images. So here we see uh, we have a full, um, full size image here, uh, 2.3 megabytes on this image. Um, this was a pretty large image. It's uh, after compression. Um, a, with their recommendations, at least, uh, we can get it down to about 430 kilobytes uh, to get a much quicker load um, on the total amount of images. Um, so here we are um, with their, one of their photos here, um, 685 kilobytes on this photo uh, on its initial size. If we resize it, uh, it's recommending that we take it to a JPEG that's 51.2 kilobytes. Uh, which is 7.5% 7, 7 of the initial size of that file, um, which will increase our load time quite a bit. And I think I already showed you the score on that one. Um, but it does go through all the images that load on any particular page. And you can actually even download uh, the updated pictures uh, for, right from here if you wanted to then upload them to the site. Back to the slideshow. So we had an F for our score in compressed images on our first run through uh, before we compress them. We got it to an A afterwards, and we got our load time down to 4.558 seconds, uh, which improved that quite a bit. Uh, just to show uh, before and after on this, those images, uh, following the recommendations that that uh, image manager offers, uh, this uh, picture of the dog, I liked it because it showed a lot of detail around the dog's eye. And that's kind of what I focused on when looking at this photo. Uh, this is 1.2 megabytes in this original image. Um, here is their recommended 92.5 kilobytes. So it's, you can see there's a slight shift in where my image is positioned, but the detail still pretty decent. Uh, barely a change at all, yet uh, a big change in load time when we go through those images. Uh, our final uh, piece on this particular site uh, was cache static content. Uh, initially, our score on that was an F. Uh, they were doing no caching. Um, we uh, switched that uh, by adding uh, a small web config entry. Um, this just allows us to um, set so that we can uh, have the cache content uh, stick around and, and uh, web page test likes cache content that's uh, two, it stays around for at least two weeks uh, for those repeat views. Um, in, or after, sorry, one week um, for the repeat views. Um, the uh, code that you put in, it just goes in the system web server section of your web config. Um, it can look just like that. Uh, best practice when doing that, a lot of uh, developers sometimes don't like to cache content for too long, especially if they're uh, uh, updating sites often. 
And if that's the case, you can use the client resource admin in DNN to increment your version, uh, which will then force the browser to uh, seek those photos again. Um, or another option is just to name your photos something different if you're updating your site. Uh, we talked about single point of failure, um, and I think that's good for showing a little bit of test here. Um, that's what the single point of failure section uh, looks like. Um, it's what you want to use if you want to isolate what happens if a third party fails to deliver content. So I have two examples of that. Um, here we have um, the single point of failure. In this case, it is uh, blocking uh, connect.facebook.net. Essentially, you can black hole so that, si so that uh, does not appear. Um, the, uh, that is the only change that's here. It does give us a slight load delay, and I'll scroll down. Um, the tool gives us a nice ability to have a transparency and show what the load is like because it runs through the test twice. This is the load if we don't have Facebook fail, um, in which case uh, we get uh, content um, appearing right about here. Um, but after we introduce the point of failure for Facebook, we can see that the document complete doesn't fire till after 22 seconds, but we still get content loaded pretty quickly. So Facebook didn't have a whole lot of effect on it uh, when, we, when we use that as a single point of failure. However, we can have a big effect um, if it's something that's pretty important to the site. So in this case, our test is uh, using the single point of failure as their uh, fastfonts.net, um, their font provider. They use some pretty fancy fonts on the site. Um, our first test through um, with uh, out fast fonts failing, um, we get a load time of five seconds. But when we fail the fast uh, the font, uh, we can see it gives us a, a, a storyboard view um, of the site load, and we're getting zero content all the way through until we hit the 20 second range uh, at 22 and a half seconds, where we start to see some content appearing as it gives up and says, okay, I can't load that font, but 22 seconds before the page starts to render. So troubleshooting the time to first byte, we talked about that initially. Um, time to first byte, uh, there's a lot of things that can contribute to it. So uh, a lot of people assume that time to first byte issues are hardware or hardware related, um, configuration uh, issues, et cetera. Um, they rarely are, but they can be. Um, but typically, um, server-side processing is, is generally uh, where the failure point is. But it can be a hardware issue. It can be a platform issue. Um, operating systems, supporting applications can be failing. Um, it can be a resource issue. Um, overloaded servers, if you're uh, with a web host that puts uh, too many sites on one server and they're all delivering content at the same time, uh, that can be a, a rough, rough for a, a first byte time because all, they're all sharing the same bandwidth from that machine. It can be a network issue, a uh, network bottleneck. Uh, can appear anywhere in the path between the user and the host. So it could be on the machine side, it could be on the user side, and anywhere in between. Uh, it can be geographic latency, as we saw uh, with our load time from the United Kingdom um, from, to, while testing from Denver. Um, it can be the SSL handshake. Um, so that's going to make a big difference as well. Um, Server-side application processing, though, is generally the largest uh, piece of the puzzle for figuring out why your time to first byte is slow. So in this case, uh, looking at a site uh, which has a really poor time to first byte, um, we note there that it is an 18 second time to first byte on the first view, uh, 13 seconds on the repeat view. This test we did run twice. Um, the reason why this one failed or had such a poor first byte time was actually because of a licensing issue that was occurring. Um, this customer, I, I, uh, they reached out to us um, right after their uh, module provider for their video gallery uh, module um, had turned off their licensing server, apparently had gone out of business, and so that's what our, our error logs told us, and we learned that right off, uh, but we did ran, run the web page test to see what the cause was, uh, and that helped lead us to that. Um, but uh, time to first byte can be a lot of different things. This is uh, back to the uh, time to first byte for their development site, uh, where we have a, a time to first byte of 1.035 seconds. Now, in this case, uh, we are seeing um, uh, potentially many different reasons why this first byte time is, is uh, slow. Um, 
the, I didn't run a script on this, by the way. It's just straight to that site. Um, so why is it slow on this one? Well, in this case, if we look at the content for the site, and we'll launch web page test here, um, we note that we see a screenshot here, if it saved it, and it did not, of course, <laughs> but that's okay, because I do have a screenshot of it here. Um, we note up in the top that actually is a trial version of a, of a module on the site, so we had a situation where a, a license, server-side processing uh, for validating a license uh, was occurring, and that's what made our site uh, load slow on this one. So, any questions about that? Okay. So, kind of getting to wrap things up, um, I saw this quote from Moby, and I thought it was kind of important to think about when we're thinking about uh, performance of a website. Um, at the risk of sounding pedestrian, I'll be completely honest, the first thing I do in the morning is check Google News, partially because it seems sort of random and unbiased, and partially because I tend to stay in hotels that don't necessarily have the fastest internet connections. So if, if anyone who uses Google News knows, Google News uh, loads real fast. Uh, their content is very, very plain, uh, not a lot of style to it. Um, but it's set up to, to run quickly, and people make choices to visit sites that are not a bother for them. Um, so if you attempt to access a website and it loads slow or forces a lot of ads or is otherwise annoying, you'll probably move on to other options. And so I, th I thought that was a very apt quote for that. So that's the end of my presentation. So sorry I had a little, little jumps around there, but uh, did you guys have any questions? Yes. Yes. I'm familiar with the G3 metrics uh, dot com, also using Google Page Speed. Mm -hmm. um, but I just tested the same site you were testing, and I see some difference in measuring code. For instance, Google Page Speed mentioned something about the G ship. GZIP, GZIP compression, yep, and I, I think I missed that slide somewhere in, in my going back and forth between browsers and the slideshow, sorry about that. That was, uh, um, maybe I can back up to it. Uh, at some point we have, where we're seeing uh, compressed transfer, or maybe I missed the slide. Um, compressed transfer, I'm showing as an A here. Uh, this uh, initially did not have, uh, I don't think it had gzip enabled, but I think I, maybe I missed that test or didn't load that in my slides, I'm sorry about that. Um, but if you're running the test currently on this, you will see different results than what we're running here because you're getting it from the live site. This is a historical view um, that web page test uh, kindly saves for us so that we can look back in time to see um, how a site loaded previously. But does that influence the way uh, Google indexes sites based on content instead of speed? It does. It absolutely does. Yeah, and that's, um, as we all know, that they, they're... Yeah, there's, if your site is, is, is slow, you're, you're going to have some search engine problems with it. Um, you're, you're definitely not going to have a priority uh, ranking in search. Is that what, you're, what you mean by that? No, I, it's more like if I compress and if I cache uh, my content, mm -hmm. for instance, then I can imagine that the, um, the uh, update speed of the content is not the same if it's not cached. Right, correct. So it can, I can imagine that Google says, okay, this is more accurate content because it's not cached. Right. So it's accurate, it's, uh, uh, I will get a higher index than not accurate content. And, that, and that's possible for that to happen. Yeah, I agree with that. So. You mentioned uh, theme sizes. Mm -hmm. Is there a uh, Best practice standard for uh, You know, that's a really good question. Um, Commerce Bank Wyoming is, is like I, I mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, touchy site for our client. Um, they, if it's down for 10 seconds, they have a problem with it. A lot of times, uh, if, especially when you're using a, a monitoring tool um, that's, that's checking your site constantly and reporting it to you, um, it's, if you have a, a slow loading site, it, you're, you can time out. Uh, that testing service can time out and it can look like it's down. Um, in, in, I look at what we, this original slide we looked at about bounce rates and think, uh, to me, I think about a four second load time is, is a pretty decent load time to shoot for. Um, 
you know, it's, it, everyone's a little bit different and it depends on what you're trying to host. It, so yeah, I guess I mean more like the actual like kilobytes or megabytes mm -hmm. of, of the overall payload of your website. It's, it, you know, your, your host is going to have some influence on that and your, your you know, the user's um, internet connection is going to have some influence on that, but probably somewhere in the maybe <laughs> Six megabyte range uh, is probably a good number to shoot for. Um, certainly, getting up into the, you know, eight, ten, fourteen, it's definitely you're going to have a high bounce rate for that because you're going to have slow load times. In Canada, we uh, struggle with this because we have some of the highest cell phone plan rates. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, people, uh, the, the data plans are very expensive. Yes. So if you have websites that are megabytes in file size. Yes. The, generally, they're not, and that's and I, I didn't talk too much about that cost feature that you see in, at the end there next to fully loaded. Um, I, I I don't like the metrics that they use for that, so that's why I I tend to ignore that piece. But it, they do um, generally try to um, web page test. If you select that, maybe I'll bring this up and show you how that is. If this saved it from my old test, um, but it, it gives you what this would cost in different markets to load this page. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize Canada was so expensive, so. Canada has extremely high cell phone prices. But you, but you, you have good, good network connections there, so. Yeah, yeah, the networks are good, uh, but uh, they cost <laughs> Yeah, that's, so it, I'm glad you brought that up, because it's, it's something I generally don't pay attention to um, as far as from a troubleshooting perspective for customers. Um, we use web page test a lot. So as a, as a web host, um, you're, you, when you see problems with your site that you've identified, um, you generally reach out to your host because you think something they're doing is wrong. Uh, that's the standard thing, and I don't blame anyone for that. Um, so we use web page test a lot of times to prove that we, we're not doing something wrong. <laughs> it's, it's to prove our innocence um, and show, you know, kind of lead back to where, where a, a problem or bottleneck might occur. Um, but yeah, you, you get too big, and, and a, that that site, if you had to pay 97, and I think 97 cents sounds a little unreasonable even for Canada, to load that page. Do, do you disagree with that? Uh, I guess I'm not sure what they're, they're basing off of 500 megabyte allowance. So. Yeah. And I guess in Canada, two, two gigabytes uh, data per month costs, uh, on average, a new, a new cell phone plan, like yeah. 60 Canadian dollars a month. Oh, wow, I feel so, so sad for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I got an old plan, so I get a little better than that. But, uh, yeah, if your grandfather didn't, I suppose yeah. it's better. But I, when I've looked at these numbers before, I, I just they, they seemed really off to me. Um, so I've, it's not been a focus for me. Um, but generally, I think you know being under four megabytes is is probably you know a, a great target to shoot for. In reality. I think a lot of times when we're developing sites these days, we want to throw as much content we, as we can on that home page, um, and that's you know generally that's your your where people are landing. I mean they they're rarely going to slash about us or some other page on your site. So if you you have that load time be large, you know maybe you know put the content on there that you need there and move the content that you need elsewhere onto different pages, sub pages of that home page, uh, so that you're. You're allowing people to choose what they're downloading rather than forcing it all on them. So, any other questions? Yeah, how, how they use the CDN might change. You know, um, I didn't uh, talk about CDN on this one, and mainly because Commerce Bank Wyoming, they're very close to Bellevue where it's hosted uh, primarily. Um, so, having a, a CDN delivering content from Europe or from uh, other parts of the United States probably isn't going to be a benefit for this site. Um, so, for the analysis we did for this customer, we, we wouldn't do that. But it actually does have a big effect on your load time, um, especially when you're remote from where the site is actually hosted. So, especially when you're here and you're looking at manage.com and I'm uh, directing that content to a Bellevue, Nebraska server, if I have that uh, delivered from a CDN, you're going to be getting some of those image, images and static files from right here in Europe. As a matter of fact, for a while we did have manage.com on uh, DNN Sharp's CDN, uh, which I, uh, you guys uh, don't see Bogdan in here, but uh, very quality product, easy to set up and use. Uh, and Bogdan did let us use that for a while, um, which, which we liked, and it did improve our load times, especially worldwide. Um, not so much locally, um, but our, our customers are everywhere, so it was a benefit from everywhere. Um, You, you, 
it, it does, but it's, your benefit is going to be really minimal. Your, your benefit, if, if everyone, if, if you're in Spain and your site's hosted in Spain and your, your customers are also in Spain, the, the CDN is... is Right. When we were on HTTP one, yes, HTTP one. If you know, since we couldn't asynchronously download that content, distributing it elsewhere was helpful. Um, but with HTTP two, um, as long as the the bandwidth is is good enough to get it all at the same time, um, downloading it all from one source shouldn't have much of an effect. Um, your your biggest gain is a geographic gain. For the CDN, but you might see you might see a little bit better if you know if if you're loading a, a very rich content site that's you know six eight ten megabytes, um, and you could be loading that from other sources, um, and there those you know sources are have competing resources or competing sites on that server, um, you'll you'll definitely see a difference. So um, potentially on that, but it's normally in normal usage, geographic is really where it's the biggest benefit is. And yes. Uh, maybe everyone's seen it, but is there an option for checking it in mobile conditions? It is, yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't cover that more. Um, there's a couple different options for that, and we'll just go back to uh, the, I'll just see if I can get back to the main test area. Um, they actually, uh, interestingly enough, have um, in Dulles, uh, Virginia, which is just outside of Washington, D.C., um, they actually have a, a, and I've seen photos of this, a string of devices actually hooked up. So they have um, several iPhones, um, Galaxy S9, et cetera, um, all kind of lined up in a row. Um, there's not many of them. They're actually using those physical devices to do this. Um, but you can see the list of Android devices there and Apple devices that are in Dulles. Um, and the, sometimes though when you select these, and, and just for fun, maybe we should launch one on one of these. Let's just pick. So I want to pick something that might be pretty high use. I think that says iPhone 8. Um, and then we'll just test. This might take a second to run, uh, which actually would just kind of be the point. Uh, so we'll do dnnconnect.org on that iOS 8 device or iPhone 8 device. Um, we see we're, we're waiting at the front of the queue, which actually is not too bad. Um, a lot of times I've gone in to see these devices and you might be waiting behind 10, 12, 50 other tests. You know, uh, some of these are in pretty high demand. Alternatively, um, there's also options in the Chrome tab to do um, essentially, uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of, uh, where you're, you're synthesizing that mobile experience um, through Chrome, uh, which has the capabilities to do that. Um, and maybe I should just, there we go, and that should, not too bad of a test there. Five seconds from, from the US on a mobile device, not too bad. Um, for our site hosted in the Netherlands. Um, the options there on the advanced settings allow us to choose that in Chrome as well, where we can choose a mobile browser um, uh, synthesizing. I don't know the right word to say right now. Um, and it, we have a lot of choices that uh, Chrome has built in. So not quite as accurate as using the actual device because you're using, uh, you're, you're synthesizing the screen resolution, you're synthesizing um, the, uh, the device in, in from a browser perspective, but not necessarily from a processing power perspective because it's, it's doing it still on a, on a full size computer, so yeah. Any, yes? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You can go direct to that page. Um, and that's um, actually, we should, where was the tab that I, this is not really the lazy loading, but it's uh, kind of does show us, this is DNN Connect that we just tested. A good example of, of seeing a, a, how an HTTP2 site does load. Uh, because we get all that asynchronous content coming from the server. Uh, but it also does show um, some of the impact of the redirects. In this case, we have uh, redirect to uh, uh, www as well as a, a security redirect to HTTPS. Um, but yeah, it's, you can um, configure it for all kinds of things like that. So.
Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you guys for your time. Um, we went just about 50 minutes, so you guys get out of here early and uh, get to go have cocktails. So <laughs> thank you guys.